Good morning, everybody. And so, um, first of all, I want to thank Nathaniel and the Case Western folks, you know, Dave, Christina, and Nathaniel. Again. I mean, this is great. This is fantastic. So, for those who don't know me, I'm the Bill Lyles that Phil was blaming all the other project on. Uh, and again, this is a, a group project, and that person right there is the same person that's working with Phil from uh, UMass Boston. And the only hams on that list is myself and Laura at uh, George Mason. He's a geology professor. Okay, so Eclipse Mob. What is it? So back in 2017, you all know about the Eclipse. Here's the form, a crowdsourced project to collect data dealing with propagation over the Eclipse, right? Okay. So we were doing it down at LF, WWVB, 60 kilohertz, which you all know about. And so we, when it says two countries here, that's not including the United States. That's Guatemala and Canada. Uh, we distributed 150 kits. However, uh, when we ran out of kits, because we ran out of money, all the instructions were up on the website, and people just looked, ordered stuff from DigiKey, Mauser, Amazon, wherever, and built them. And some of the people who built those kits had never built anything electrical or mechanical before in their lives. It was amazing. Uh, if you remember the schools that I mentioned was associated with this, is George Mason, which is in Northern Virginia, and UMass Boston. Look where most of the kits went. Okay? Not, not the best geographical dispersion. Okay. So why were we doing this? Well, back in the early heydays of AM radio, it was decided to do one by Scientific America back in 1925. There was the total eclipse over the U.S. And I'm amazed. Scientific American got over 2,000 letters in from people reporting of what happened during the eclipse. I think that's a great turnout. However, there was never an analysis done of those 2,000 letters. Why? People forgot to put down what day they collected the data. You know, it would have been nice if they actually collected on the day of the eclipse. Uh, if they did put the date, sometimes they neglected to put the time. They're listening to AM radio stations. They neglected to say which AM station they were listening to. They even neglected to say where they were located. So, 2,000, awesome. Couldn't do analysis, okay? So, that was the problem. Now, the hams, they had some problems too, but guess what? They, they, they figured it out pretty quickly. Okay. So, 2017, what do we have? The first total solar eclipse of the United States where we now have things like GPS and smartphones. What do smartphones have built into them? GPS and time and date, right? I said, okay, we're going to solve this problem by using smartphones. So let's crowdsource this. Let's take care of that. You know, you folks can read that faster than I can say anything about it. This is what we did. We had a project coordination team. We had people whose entire job on the project is worrying about social media. Uh, what we did not estimate is how much work that actually took. We had two people. I needed more. Okay. Uh, we put out instructions. We put out training. We put out web-based training webinars that were approved for teachers in primary schools, secondary schools, and that to receive credit and continuing education for taking that training. Turns out you have to go through a whole approval cycle to do that. I have to thank the rest of the team for knowing how to do that. But we had teachers from around the United States. And the main problem we had with the teachers were trying to explain to them why does the eclipse go from west to east when the sun goes from east to west? Okay? So, but, you know, we got them all there. There's the kit. Notice we even gave them the tool to strip the wires. I wanted to put in a knife. Uh, health and safety people said, no way. And I said, they have to learn how to use a knife at some point, right? So um, it actually, 
is a pretty good kit, and that plastic box right there that everything ships in actually becomes the frame for the loop antenna. So they actually wrap the, the wire around that. And it was interesting. It's 400 tons of wire, of magnet wire, okay? Uh, the Eldots didn't like that. The kids wrapped it fine. Okay. So I said that the phone was a, used as an SDR. So here's what we do. I'm going to start out down here. The phone puts out on the headphone output a tone. That tone goes into a mixer, which acts as a frequency doubler. Because remember, I got 60 kilohertz coming in. That won't go in through the microphone input. Turns out it used to go through on the phones because they used to say, okay, people were only going to use the microphone headset that comes with the phone, so that does the filtering. Turns out now they have filters in phones. Change over the time of the project. Phones are always changing. So then we use the doubled frequency to mix this one back down so that we can receive it into the headphone. Okay? Understand what we're doing? So, we th so all we had to do was build that. So that's a chip, that's a chip, and that's a chip. Very simple circuit. All the heavy lifting is done by the phone. We had the kids doing it, all sorts of people. And George Lemaster, who's sitting over there, is right here. This is, there I am holding an antenna. There's somebody over on the internet talking to us. We ran sessions trying to get people up to speed on doing this stuff. Okay. Lots of interest. Great. Uh, the university professors were kind of amazed. They're used to publishing papers in journals when nobody ever asks them a single question about what the paper means because nobody else understands what the paper means. Now they're getting calls from NPR, TV stations, all sorts of folks, and they're just not used to, they said, what is all this publicity, right? They're, they're showing up in places where, you know, and the president of the, you know, the university is asking, hey, what's this project you're doing that, you know, I'm getting these phone calls on? It's a very different experience for them. Okay. So, the task is simple. They can assemble it. Like I said, people who have never built anything before in their life assembled it. I sent somebody earlier. We got an email from a 12-year-old girl who said, hey, uh, how about doing this on... Um, on print circuit board, so she made print circuit board. What happened? Oh, well, we didn't have an app when we started sending out the kits, so nobody could test this stuff. Big mistake. And it turns out the phones again change, so when you plug something in the headphones, thing for the mic, it doesn't turn on the external mic, so I have lots of people talking about the Eclipse and get no data over the radio receiver we made. Okay, but we've learned our lesson. So, there's the path of the upcoming eclipse, and yes, you know, Ohio got it, MIT didn't. So, okay, so we're going we're gonna to do this project differently. We're going to have a dedicated program manager. George, I, and the others, you know, doing a little thing part-time doesn't work. We're going to really do it on social media far more, and we're going to have the app. Well, we won't use an app, will we? Okay. So what happened to the phones? They eliminated the audio jack. The way of me getting into the phone doesn't exist anymore, or won't by then. Uh, so we have to do something different. So we're just going to do a direct receiver. And so basically, we're using a PIC, a Raspberry Pi. PIC has an ADD converter. We just take it all in, digitize it. And like I said, we're doing WWVB. Right, 60 kilohertz, but guess what? There's other stations lower than that. I want them too. And so I'm going to just take that whole LF, VLF band in there. Okay. We have an instrumentation amplifier up front. We still want people to have some sort of experience that they did something, so they get to plug the chips in. And hopefully they don't plug them in backwards. <laughs> Okay, but, so we're going to do it on PCBs because today I can manufacture that stuff easily and it'll probably be surface mount, but, because nobody cares, it's, it's cheaper, okay. So there it is, I have an instrumentation amplifier, low pass filter, bias it up, ADD converter, and there's my WWVB signal coming in. 
Okay, so now this is being all prepared and checked out up by Mass Boston, the two students who were the first two authors of this. Okay, so we're going to go for lots because you heard the Steve Sermon talk about, you know, he's one site looking at WWB. You heard Ward saying, hey, look, we want people to cross it. Well, I want people to cross that path and also to be totally on one side and totally on the other side of it, right? So we're going to try to play that with lots and get data so I can figure out really what that atmosphere is doing and using, collecting sounded data at the same time. Doing the eclipse, uh, you heard sounders go like every 15 minutes. We had a sounder up in Idaho going every minute. And that raw data is available for anybody who wants to analyze it. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> one, of the, one of the problems that you're going to have is because the scale of the project is so much larger, you're going to need a um, distributed mentor to right. help, help people. If we can get ahead of this through the ARL, maybe QST something, we could sign up interested and knowledgeable hams as local mentors and resources for these groups. And that would also uh, provide another uh, exposure for amateur radio into this. But that would take the load off your group trying to manage this huge project. Yeah, so what we're planning to do right now is distribute that in that we will be holding in the summer some workshops up in Boston and down at George Mason to teach the next group of instructors, if you will. So we're going to bring them in, teach them. So we bring in those hams and some non-ham, teach them, and then let them hold workshops in their locales because we're not going to be able to, to as, as you just pointed out, travel every place and do this. Right. And so, yeah, we want to scale it up. So how... Let's talk about that. Yeah. I've, I've done that for the past two years, and, and he's on board. We, we're just not there yet. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Joe, of the, the new receiver, I, I think I, I caught that that does not use a, a smartphone. Correct. The, the, the Raspi does all the signal processing and, and, and The PIC does some of it because okay. the, there's an FPGA on it. I see. Okay. And then the, the Raspberry Pi is basically making sure we got comms out to get back onto the Internet. Okay. And I think you, uh, so there's, there's no need for a Wi-Fi connection or anything because I think... You, you oh, unless that's how you go to the Internet. No, we're not oh, Wi-Fi to the phone. Okay. That makes the, sense. That makes there, sense. There's now. just... Too much variability in the phones, and they change too often, that I can't rely upon what anybody has. We'll have to get with the phone makers about that. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Along with the phones, it might be wise to have a contingency plan if some of the chips that you have selected are no longer available five <laughs> years from now. I ran into this when building a, a version one Satnogs thing. Uh, you know, it's that project for tracking satellites. Why? Some of the uh, devices originally specified in design uh, are no longer available, and you have to get or create something to be equivalent. Yes, I, 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 I agree. In fact, the, right now, the most expensive chip we use in this thing is the instrumentation amplifier and it's made by TI and I'm, it used to be Burr Brown I, and I'm just really concerned that someday that chip is going to be gone. Anything else? Okay, thank you. <laughs>